Content creators add immense value in brand messaging, and collaborating with them helps to increase sales and improve brand perceptions. What makes collaborations with influencers and content creators work effectively to benefit both brands and their customers? What should you consider as a brand or agency when selecting an influencer or content creator to partner with? In this episode, arts director, comedian, and content creator Donovan Goliath shares his views on what makes great brand and content creator collaborations. What what worked for us was uh, brands going, oh, shucks, we, we don't have to be quiet. You know, we can still get stuff out. Let's just hand over whatever projects to this guy or this team. Um, they look like they can get our messaging out, you know, in fun, interesting ways, especially during this time. And that, you know, was, was a snowball effect. I mean, it took a lot of content. I mean, we must have put out about 30 or so pieces before we got that first um, that first collab, which was with VW. He has worked with many leading brands such as VW, Defy, Casa Light, Dove, and many others. You know, I've done some really interesting things with Standard Bank as well. Um, they've also allowed me just to be me. As an art director, Donovan Goliath understands brand and agency partnerships as well as the value of a powerful human insight. Start writing scripts that naturally fit into the social media landscape because there is a texture on the social media landscape. People get used to a rhythm and a style and a tone of videos, you know? I mean, you don't have 10 seconds to intro something. We also talk about what brands and agencies should do before approaching content creators. Once again, everything starts looking the same. It's very hard to to write award-winning ads when you're just taking a person who's famous on the internet and throwing them in and hoping that, you know, magic happens. It never goes that way. Should brands go directly or rely on their agencies to establish these content creator partnerships? I think relatability is the word. I think if brands started becoming much more relatable and started telling stories that really resonate with with people, um, that's going to win. This is The Lead Creative. Welcome to The Lead Creative Podcast, where we talk to creative industry leaders, influencers, and brands. We discuss the strategies that influence brand thinking and shape industries. Thought leaders and heads of agencies let us in on some of their thinking and insights. I'm your host, Mongi Simtati. Enjoy the show and please share and subscribe. Donovan, um, thank you very much for joining us on The Lead Creative. And before we start, congratulations on your nominations on the DSTV Content Creator of the Year Award. Thank you. That's thank awesome. Thank you, bro. Um, yeah, I got three nominations that day and I was super surprised, you know, because, I mean, I just sent through what I thought was cool, um, wasn't expecting anything. And then, bam, you know, I get three nominations on the day. So, yeah, we crossing fingers, hoping uh, we win because I never win anything ever. <laughs> so this is going to be this is going to be an interesting one. No, absolutely, absolutely. And and I mean you've done you've been doing a lot in recent times of course with the content that you've been creating um on and off stage uh quite a lot. And one of the things that you've said in the past or you've said before is that you saw a rise in the number of projects that you were getting uh, from brands and agencies during that lockdown period when everybody was yeah. at home. What do you think it is about that time that made brands and agencies kind of get it more in terms of working with content creators? Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I mean, if we take a step back, there are very few people, are very few content creators actually who, who, um, who really thrived and did well during that time. Um, guys who saw the gap, guys who kind of uh, realized that, you know, people are going to be at home, they're going to be bored, they're going to be consuming a lot of TV, they're going to be on their phones a lot, uh, they've got nowhere to go, they've got nothing else to do, so why not jump in and, you know, provide the entertainment for them? That's exactly the reason why my wife and I started making content is, you know, we, we're not the kind of people who just kind of sit and relax and, you know, go, ah, okay, let's just take some time out. And, you know, this, you know, especially now during that time, we were like, okay, as, as I mean, we're both performers. She's a classical violinist. I I was full on in comedy at the time. We were like, hey, man, 
let's uh, let's jump on the internet and let's let's create stuff, you know, to entertain ourselves, but to entertain people as well. And it really took off. People started loving it. Uh, you know, people started sharing a lot of what we were doing. We were just trying to do a lot of stuff that was quite different. Um, and I think they liked the duo, you know, uh, the, the fact that we were creating content together, which was the first time we had done that. We'd never come together and, you know, just kind of fused our our disciplines. Um, and, you know, with the collaboration thing, I think, uh, you know, what happened there, production houses uh, were obviously on hold um videographers and photographers who often shoot for a lot of content creators weren't available to shoot for them i'm fortunate enough you know i'm a former art director i'm able to do all of the stuff myself i mean all the content we made during lockdown was shot on an iphone this one right here right um i edit i i um i grade i use photoshop i i i do all of it you know and i think what what worked for us was uh, brands going, oh, shucks, we, we don't have to be quiet. You know, we can still get stuff out. Let's just hand over whatever projects <clears throat> to this guy or this team. Um, they look like they can get our messaging out, you know, in fun, interesting ways, especially during this time. And that, you know, was, was a snowball effect. I mean, it took a lot of content. I mean, we must have put out about 30 or so pieces before we got that first, um, that first collab, which was with VW at the time. VW asked us to make, uh, Really nice piece of content, which um, which was all about. Um, I can't even remember what the title was, but essentially uh, road tripping at home. So we recreated the the tropes of what a road trip would look like, but at home. You know, so going to the shop to buy snacks, peeing on the side of the road. You know that classic when your hand is out the window and the wind is blowing your hand, like all those little bits. But we all did it, you know, from 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 the inside of our home, and. You know, from there, it just started building. We just started getting more and more calls to work on stuff. And as a result, I mean, shucks, man, I haven't been on stage and done like full on stand up in the last two years because I've just been working, you know, on on, on creating content and um, I guess um, consulting, um, you know, and just, you know, trying to find uh, just interesting ways to communicate and tell stories online. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, so, so you, you were a lot of hats. I mean, there's a content creator hat, there's a comedian, there's, 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 there's obviously art directing, which is, I suppose, where I would say you kind of started, yeah. if, 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 if that's correct, right? So, so, um, how, how, how does the process, your creative process differ when you are Donovan, putting out a rap video, which you did quite a mm. lot, um, you know, um, at some stage before, um, I feel like in the past two years, you haven't done as much of that as you were prior, yeah. uh, but I used to see your stuff quite a lot, uh, back then. Um, how do you, how would you say your creative process is different when doing, when wearing a hat for creating content when you've parted with a brand versus when you're Donovan creating um, content that is just for entertainment and for, 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 for just um, getting, you know, getting creative content out yep. there for yourself. It's all the same. Um, I, I, I've got the same creative process for everything, for writing comedy, for, you know, coming up with just personal fun content that I'm trying to shoot out when collaborating with brands, you know, my process is I'm, I'm old school. You know, I start with pen and paper first before I even hit the computer, before I even start referencing anything, before I even hit the internet, man. I Pen and paper, I storyboard, I come up with like 20, 30, 40 different ideas or possible angles to tackle something and just start filtering down and seeing, you know, which one has the most potential, which one um, do I feel is going to resonate, you know, with the audience, uh, which one makes me laugh first. You know, I, I, that's what I always look at. You know, I, I think that it's, it's the danger of making content online. You know, if you start doing stuff, it's a conversation that Tyson Gubeni and I had once actually, where, you know, the second you start making stuff that people gravitate towards you, it becomes harder and harder to make that content organically because your brain tricks you and you start making what you think they want to see. You know, and when that happens, you start to doubt yourself and you can see some of the stuff then starts to feel a little bit too polished or it just doesn't feel as, as, as um, organic or as meaty as it did the first time you dropped it, you know, because you were just doing it because you thought it was cool. So 
I always yes, try yes. and, um, you know, kind of look at and look at what I'm doing, look at what it's trying to say. What is the story? What is the beginning? What is the middle? What is the end? How does it look? You know, does it look, uh, you know, like I've shot it on a phone or do I step up the production a little bit? So I always ask these questions before I put it out. Because the, I always think about what is the outtake that I actually want here from the audience? You know, do I want them to laugh? Do I want them to admire, um, you know, the, the, the wit in whatever I'm doing, do I want them to spot the, you know, clever little editing tricks, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those things, uh, you know, I, I, I think about, it's never just, oh, here's an idea. Let me shoot it. Let me put it out. There's a lot that goes into, uh, you know, just that prep work on paper. Like I say, before I start finding, uh, you know, references or whatever shooting styles, et cetera, online, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, like I say, it's with anything, even when I'm writing a gag before I go, uh, you know, to, for, for, for comedy, for stage, I, I sit and yes. I kind of go through multiple ways this gag could start, uh, different characters that could be in the gag. Um, you know, is it me telling the story, uh, story, or am I, you know, bringing on an alter ego, you know, to tell the story? What is the punchline? Which, you know, it's how long is the gag? Is it a short thing? Is it a long yeah, story? Yeah, yeah. So I ask all of these questions and yeah, my process is really the same for all of them. It's, you know what? And I like that you asked this question because a lot of people often see the end result of what you do. And sometimes it can look true. super simple, yes. but I mean, I, I don't know if you've noticed, I always like to shoot how I made it videos, which is actually one of the pieces I'm nominated for at Content Creator. Exactly, uh, exactly. That's what I noticed. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. so I like to shoot the how I made it because I think, one, it's an extra layer of content. Two, uh, a lot of people never get to see how things are made. You know, you see the end result and you mm -hmm. move on. But I think there's something cool about uh, you know, seeing somebody, one, shoot it with the phone, seeing the setup, uh, I mean, I recently posted a video where I faked being in the snow, but, and then I showed the behind the scenes and it was, <laughs> I used bicarb and uh, shaving cream, you know, to make snow and to get that consistency. So all of these little tricks, you know, like, like visual, visual angles, you know, that, that, that you can, you, that I, I think it's, it's very cool to expose that stuff to people. Um, I think it makes them appreciate this your craft true, yeah. Yeah. a little bit more. And I always like to let people know um, that I'm the one, you know, controlling the strings here, you know, that I don't have a big team behind me. And, uh, you know, last two years ago, I did an interview where somebody, you know, the, there was there was this notion that there's no way I'm shooting everything on my phone. So I had to shoot a lot of videos and show people that I am, you know, uh, that and, and the yeah. reason I did that is because I really, you know, I want people to 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 kind of walk away thinking that, that, that there actually is no, there's no excuse. I mean, if you have a smartphone um, and you've got access to the internet, you literally, you know, and, and a really good idea, the world is yours. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you, you can just Absolutely. sit. Absolutely. Your, your only job is to sit down and find um, an interesting story to tell and, and, and an original way to tell it, you know, with, with, with the, the, the tools that you have. I mean, just if I had a whatever camera, you know, something super expensive, um, I don't know if it would change the quality of the content because I, I never think of the, of the hardware. I always think of the idea for me. It doesn't matter what I shoot on. The idea is still going to be strong. The idea is still the thing that I want yes, people to yes. take away. It, I never want people to sit mm. and and go, ah, oh, man, that looked that looked. It was such terrible quality. It was this. It was that. It doesn't matter what the quality looks like. It doesn't matter what it was shot on. Was the idea good? Is the idea strong? And is that the thing that people are going to walk away with? That's it. You know, that's how I um, that's how I tackle every single project. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. There's something I want to, there's something I want to go back to and what you've just mentioned. And this is very important, um, I guess, right now because of my, the realizations that I'm having and also some material that I'm reading, which is the conversation you mentioned you had with Tyson Gubeni where you spoke about uh, the moment you create it for a brand or the moment you start feeling like you're creating it for a particular audience, you, you, this, this element of imposter syndrome yeah. 
can sometimes seep in. How do you, as a content creator, know that that um, like fight that off? Because a lot of the time you're creating by yourself. You have the idea. You start, you know, you start working on the idea, building the beginning, middle, end, and you start filming this thing. So you don't have an audience as you would in other times when you're on stage, when you have immediate feedback. Yes. This is after yes. the fact. How do you know? How do you balance that? Very difficult, you know, and I, <laughs> a lot of people are always shocked when I say this, but I've got the worst imposter syndrome, you know, because I just don't like to disappoint people. You know, I'm I'm always just, I guess I'm a little bit of a perfectionist as well, which is such a bad thing because a lot of times I, I procrastinate too much. I stay on an idea or on a thought for too long, you know, versus just putting it out. Like in my heart of hearts, I know that this is the way to go. This is right. But then you go, yeah, but what if, you know, but what if this and what if they didn't like this? Or, you know, I have all of these questions. And, and I think that's another reason why I try and get, as much out on paper as possible. I need to get it out of me to be comfortable with that one idea that I think is the one that's going to work. Um, I've gotten better at it. You know, it took me a while um, to, to, to really get over that, uh, that hump. And, and, you know, in, 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 I think the year one of lockdown or the first couple of months, my wife and I, we were just putting out any and everything anything we thought was cool. Like literally we wake up that morning and go, yeah, yeah, th this would be cool to shoot. Let's go, you know, and then bam, and we release it. And, you know, later on that day, we probably put another one out. So for us, it was uh, quality and quantity. That's the game that we were playing, you know, um, because I think secretly we kind of knew that there was a small window for us to operate in because once things opened up again, uh, you know, the, the attention kind of moves on to, to, to everybody else. And I liked that phase that we were in where, you know, we weren't too stuck on curating too much. It was really just about entertaining and putting out what we thought was cool. And that's where the issue comes in. I think when you try and curate too much and, you know, everything has to fit in this box and look and feel a certain way. It always must be symmetrical. The lighting must be exactly the same because that's what people like. Um, it puts a lot of pressure on you and and, and that's where the self-doubt comes in because you, you're often never going to have that perfect scenario um, to shoot in. The audio, wherever you're shooting, isn't going to be right. The background setting isn't going to be right for your idea. And that's when you start doubting yourself, you know. Uh, I think there are a lot of creators who, and I wish I was like them, you know. I mean, Elsa Majimbo, for example, who could pick up a phone anywhere, <laughs> And just shoot and release it because it's not it's not the, the 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 look and feel that we're buying into. It's just that consistent theme, that consistent idea. However, the difference is I'm also not the kind of person who can do one thing. I like to explore. That's why if you go into my feed, you're gonna see, like you mentioned earlier, on rap videos. You're going to see some art direction stuff, some Photoshop manipulation. Uh, you're going to see some Jason Statham impressions. You're going to see little sketches. You know, I just like to explore all kind of, uh, you know, avenues of, of creativity because, yeah, yeah. you know, when I was in comedy, um, I, I always, I, I think I made too many excuses not to do what I'm doing now. So one of the reasons why I haven't jumped back on stage um, in a hurry is I'm busy doing what I'm doing, one. But also, this is a perfect opportunity for me to start getting all the ideas out that I've been sitting on for the last 10 years. I've been doing comedy, you know, things mm. I've wanted to explore and just getting yes. really comfortable, you know, with just being an all-around creative person. I can always jump back on stage, um, you know, and start doing that, but... That in itself is a very difficult um, discipline, you know, trying to do comedy and trying to do what I do now, <laughs> you know, one of them is going to suffer. You can't do both. You can't be good, you know, at both mm. of them. So this is just a route that I've taken now for a while, um, really just trying to explore my options. And I might not even be doing this for a long time. You know, I mean, I've got interests in making documentaries, making movies, designing furniture, uh, you know, I just like, there's just things that I, a whole, yeah, a whole world yeah. of, yeah, a whole world of things yeah. that you'd like to explore. Um, 
Just just to um, stick with this a little bit, um, you creating um, content at home and the, the kind of content that you're creating at home as a as a husband and wife team, how do you balance the the um, just not creating content all the time, especially when you have a really great idea mm-hmm. and you just want to jump back in and just work because home is also your workplace or, or, or where you also create? How do you balance that? True. Very difficult. Um, we've been fortunate enough. We've moved into a, a much bigger place now where we can kind of separate the sort of home living area and the work area, you know, like we, we've cordoned off areas to go. You see, if you come out of this area here, you are no longer in work mode. Um, because it does, I mean, we, we, we had a, a much smaller place before, you know, where we'd finish shooting something and you kind of jump over the couch and bam, now you're chilling, you know, uh, it does, it does have an impact, especially because we had a little baby as well. You know, so you've got life happening, you know, in between all of this, um, you know, uh, madness in between a lighting setup and a camera needs to go here and trying to make sure that you don't show the baby's chair. It, it's just a lot of dynamics, <laughs> you know, that, that do get in way. It, yes, it becomes yeah, very, very yeah, tricky to do that. Yeah. So, um, you know, there were talks of potentially, you know, do we hire like a studio to go and shoot stuff? And we're like, nah, man, we don't need to. I think there is something um wonderfully organic and relatable about just using home as a backdrop for everything you know mm-hmm. without it feeling yeah, too yeah. staged and too kind of uh you know ah yeah this is definitely a studio thing you see with with, with a lot of content i make like the branded content for example um it it really is i always try and look at what i have what is the background that i can use here um, you know, and how does that dictate what the idea is going to be? Uh, and, and that's how I play it. You know, it makes my decisions a lot easier. I think if I had the option of a studio, et cetera, et cetera, it, it, it you know, when people see content, they don't want to see an ad straight off the bat. They still want to see things that are kind of relatable. Like, you know, whenever I make branded content, I never, it, it feels like branded content. But then you go, yeah, but it's but it's not branded content. Like he just somehow snuck the product in there without us realizing. I never do anything where there's like this big logo reveal at the end. It's always just kind of weaved in. So it's super, super organic. It's finding that fine line, you know, for me all the time. And I guess that it 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 goes back to to, to your question about, you know, how do you how do you balance, you know, being at home and uh, you know, your home being the studio space as well. This is a very fine line. It's very, very fine, you know, and often we've crossed over on either side and it, it does get tricky. I'm not going to lie. As a, as a, as, as a content creator, um, you know, as a content creator who started out, of course, just creating content, did you get into this space knowing that brands would be interested in getting access to your audience? Was that ever a consideration coming into this space? And how did that, how did that switch happen smoothly without losing relevance? Um, I was creating content before the lockdown happened. Obviously, not as aggressively, uh, you know. Absolutely. Uh, I didn't go into it expecting the feedback and the, the, the conversations we then ended up having. But I, in the back of my mind, I mean, gosh, man, I needed to make money, you know. We're performers, you know, we only make money when we're on stage and people are booking us to do stuff. So, you know, a small part of me, no, a decent part of me, um, you know, sat and thought about it and, and, and worked out a small strategy to go, okay, let's try and do as much organic stuff as possible and really build a community, um, you know, and, and really get people kind of to buy into what we're doing um, before the first brand comes knocking because like I say, when somebody puts money on the table and says, Hey, we're looking for this, it throws you a little bit because now you start to question 
everything like we were speaking about earlier on, you know, uh, mm, yeah. they go, yeah, yeah, no, this is how much we have. This is the ROI that we're looking for. Then you go, can I deliver this? And then you start to doubt your ideas and how strong they are. But I think I seeded that earlier. Or we seeded that earlier where, you know, when we created the, I think the brand and the rhythm that we created earlier on with a lot of the, the fashion parody posters that we did, you know, so anything that we were putting out, we were kind of playing in that vein. People sort of expected it, uh, you know, and, 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 and one of the things that I did, you know, mention whenever we collaborated with brands, if ever they wanted me to do something where I was just showing a product, Justin J, I'd say no, you know, for me, I was just like, ah. I mean, we, we're going to need this money, but you can't always succumb to the money. You know, you have to, some integrity has to, has to remain in place here because you want to be around for a long time. You know, uh, the lockdown could be a week, two weeks, a month, six months, who knows, you know, once it's over, you still want to keep yeah, going for yeah. as long as possible. So you really want to build a solid foundation and you want people to anything you put out, you want people to interact with it because you want to create an expectation as well you know, of, of what you're mm. about and what you are going to be able to put out. So, yeah, look, I think the, the, the short answer to all of this is um, it wasn't my direct intention to get brands on board, but mm. the, in the back of my mind, I did go, let's create a nice platform here for ourselves so that when anybody comes on, even they can look at it and go, oh, these are the right people for us. We can plug in, you know, to what they're trying to put out. Because we were selling positive vibes. We were selling wit. We were selling Absolutely. creativity. We were selling humor. That was it. That's the vein that we stayed in, you know, juxtaposed with what was happening in the rest of the world. I think that's why, you know, we had a lot of pull towards us, um, you know, only because of the angle that we took with, um, you know, with, 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 our, with our content. There's a there's something you mentioned about um, how you how you um, you know shoot your content, how you edit and and create and build on it, um, and 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 the fact that you know the brand, even though the, it it is branded content, the brand almost comes in smoothly without you showing the brand specifically. And I think, um, in fact, when you say that, I'm reminded of um, an ad that I saw a piece of content that I saw um, with you and DeFi yeah. on it. I think it's, uh, it's there's a free yes. agent. Um, and you close the fridge and there's an older you and there's a younger you in the same frame kind of situation. Yeah. Um, and that to me does feel a lot like um, a Donovan Goliath piece of content where it, it feels like it feels almost the same as, you know, the rap content that you, that you were to, that you would put out before lockdown and yeah. all of that. Um how do you, and then just now, of course, you're mentioning that you don't do brand for brands purposes of brand or branded content purposes. How do you then choose one, choose the brands you work with on the one hand, or also um, agree to collaborations with certain brands because there's a certain style that you want to put out there, but there's also certain, you know, certain objectives that a brand has. How do you balance this? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Look, I, I kind of look at my values first and I go, I don't do gambling, for example, because it goes against, you know, my, I don't gamble. I don't, that's not my world at all. You know, I'm not the mm -hmm. right person yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not going to force myself in jail to try and make something, um, you know, either to get, to get the bag or whatever, you know, so I always, I like to, you know, for me, I mean, even the word collaboration, I don't think is used enough because that's what it is for me. You know, I like to collaborate with the brand. I must be happy putting out this kind of content and you must be happy with what I'm going to give you as well. There must be a really cool synergy. So I have a lot of these conversations. So whenever we get that brief, my manager will send it to me and say, hey, this has come through. This is what they're looking for. I, I like to go back and look at what this brand has done before and what they stand for, um, you know, and are they only jumping on here for hype purposes? And that's happened a lot, you know, where somebody goes, ah, oh, this guy, he's, he's hot now and he's putting out a lot of stuff. Let's, let, let's get him. And I'm like, no, it's not about that, you know. 
uh, you really have to want the stuff that I'm going to put out because I'm I'm very specific, you know, with 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 things I do and 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 how I do them. And if if you don't like that and you just want me to, you know, insert whatever product it is, you know, into a video, it, it's not really going to work for me. You know, it's going to feel too forced, and then you're taking me away from what I'm trying to create, which essentially is creating entertaining interesting branded content that doesn't feel like advertising you know i think people have seen ads they know how ads start they know how ads look they know how ads feel you know but how do you create an ad that's where the hard work comes in but that's the challenge that i like as well you know when i get one of these briefs like how do i sit and really get the client's um intentions across get their story out but still make something for my audience and for me as well you know um it's 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 an interesting challenge you know and and i think when i think about it that way it, it makes my decision easier whenever anybody comes and wants to work with me i, I sit and i go there's nothing i can do for you here you know because this doesn't speak yeah, to me yeah, and yeah. It's not going to work with the way I um, the way I operate, so I just say no. And there have been instances where people almost feel offended. What do you mean? You know, we're giving you so much money. How can you just say no to it? But I'm like, yeah. But the problem is, if I say yes to this, uh, you know, it, it's really not going to feel right on my feed. Um, yeah. And yeah. then I might as well just say yes to others if I'm just taking it for the bag. Like mm. I say, bro, I'm doing this for. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get that. I get that. Mm, I get. I mean, I get the sense that in as much as you say yes to quite a few projects, you're also defined a lot by the ones you say no to, um, the ones you you don't agree to do, <laughs> because those also, um, you know, end up uh, on your on your timeline and and in your profile as well. And while sticking with just this idea of collaboration, um, which which brand collaboration stands out for you if i mean if you're not if you're not comfortable mentioning a particular brand um what was what is it about that collaboration that stands out and makes for a good example of a content creator and brand collaboration that works well i'd say i've really enjoyed working with dove you know also an interesting one like dove you know, if you go into their profile, they're very specific, you know, with how they do things, um, you know, and, and, and when they when they called me and they said, listen, we'd like you to be one of our creators, you know, one of our ambassadors, essentially, I said, I would love to, but I need you to know that I do things in a very specific way, you know, humor and wit, are, those are my... That's in my arsenal, you know. If you're not going to allow me to be the the humorous, creative, I'm trying to find the words here to describe. With, with, you know, I'm trying to find the words to describe myself without sounding too arrogant. Um, but no, no, sound arrogant if if you no. must. You're in a safe <laughs> space. <laughs> no i i get it i mean i think i think for me it's 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 um of course there's a way that you do things very specifically as you're saying where there must be that balance of humor and wits and and i'm guessing um also that that for the creativity to come through rather than just collaborating with a brand for the yeah. sake of it i think well that's part of what i'm getting Look, so okay i'll give you an example with dove Right. Um, we'd all get a brief where they would say, um, we'd like you to create or we'll send you this product. We want you to showcase um, a grooming routine. So then I sit and I go, I'm not the kind of guy to, you know, do a voiceover where I'm like washing my face and, you know, slow motion shots of me cleaning my face. And, you know, I, I don't do that. Nothing wrong with that content. That's perfect. I approach it from a different angle. I'll go how to shoot a grooming advert and then play on the tropes of every grooming advert you've ever seen 
you know? So what are the things that we all know from grooming ads? And then I play on that while, uh, and then I'll do a voiceover on top of that very left field kind of way. And I think they like that as well. You know, once again, I'm still able to get the product and the messaging across without being too literal yeah. and without being too direct. You know, Casa Light was another one, you know, who allowed me just to be me, just put, 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 put what you put out, but seamlessly integrate, you know, our product into you versus doing like lifestyle stuff, you know, where it's just like, Hey, it's a hot summer's day today. Make sure you drink this really cold Casa Light. Nah, that's boring, right? Everybody does that. Everybody has seen that before, you know? So I, um, yeah, man, I'm always trying to find um, clever ways to do these things, um, you know, that that I would want to watch. I always say to people, um, I like to write the book that I want to read, you know? And that's why I sit back and I think about, uh, you know, with specific brands. You see, like, Dove was an interesting challenge, you know, because off the bat, if somebody says Dove, it's not really it doesn't really align with my style and what I do, but I can find a way to retrofit it and make it work because it's a good, clean, wholesome brand. You know, I like what they stand for. Um, I like that they um, have very strong values behind them, that they more than just a, um, what would you call them? Uh, you, you know, play in the, in, in the cosmetic space. Um, yeah. So those two have been great. Uh, who else? I've, I've had long standing standard bank, you know, I've done some really interesting things with standard bank as well. Um, they've also allowed me just to be me, um, a lot more difficult working with the bank because they're obviously very set things that need to be said, you know, and, 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 you know, there's, there's often some pushback, you know, there's a lot of back and forth where somebody just goes, ah, this is, this is a little, it's a little too lighthearted. It's a little too funny. We need to inject more product. And I'm just like, you see, this is exactly what we spoke about in the beginning. Let's not make a retail ad here. Because the moment you make a retail ad, people are going to tune out, you know, and then it's going to look like my fault because I couldn't get you, you know, the ROI and the, the, the I guess the numbers that you were looking for. Uh, it's tricky, bro. I'm not going to lie. It is very tricky. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. I'm getting, yeah, so, so, so I'm getting, I mean, I mean, a couple of things that I'm getting there. I think I'm getting the one, I'm getting the, 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 the sense of you need to maintain your authenticity for it to be true and real and to resonate with your audience. Number one, I think. And the second one that I'm getting is it needs the reason that a brand comes to you is because they, don't they don't just want someone who can act a particular way create a certain kind of uh, piece of content they want the donovan goliath yeah. essence so you bring in that essence to the kind of work and to the kinds of collaborations um i've mentioned a bit earlier and um and you also spoke about the fact that you are an art director and you come from you know an advertising kind of background um and of course a lot has changed between the time that um you studied advertising and today when content creators are a big part of the process, how do you feel that that change has almost changed the game in advertising and should be considered even more by brands or rethought by brands in the way that brands themselves put themselves out there? Sure. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting what you've just said, man. Um, you know, I've, I mean, obviously, still have links to advertising. I host the Luries, or I used to host the Luries for four years. Um, I, I often do a lot of voiceovers where I go to agencies, uh, meet people who are still in agency, for example. Um, you know that I kind of catch up with, and even they say that it's it's getting so difficult right now um, because clients. I think that's where it starts: clients and marketers are uh, obviously always surveying the landscape, you know, what's working, what's not working. Um, who do we need to work with? Uh, who's the, the hottest influencer right now that we need to collab with? You know, that's how they think. And then they pitch these things to, to, to agencies and agencies go, but it's not what we do. You know, we don't, uh, we're not going to work with the, the, the biggest fashion influencer right now to help us sell coffee. That makes no sense. You know, because then every once again everything starts looking the same. It's very hard to to write award winning ads when you're just taking 
a person who's famous on the internet and throwing them in and hoping that, you know, magic happens. It never goes that way. So I think that, you know, it really, really is becoming tricky. People are starting to consume, not starting. I mean, people are consuming pretty much 90% of everything on their phones, you know, and ads become harder to write because you're competing against not just other visual or not visual, not just other videos on, you know, Twitter or Facebook, you're even competing against memes on WhatsApp, you know, and we always just say this in stand-up comedy, you know, sometimes stand-up comedians aren't our, our biggest competitors, right? It's TikTokers, you know, it's, it's people who yeah. are consistently yeah. sending funny memes on, 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 on WhatsApp because they become the funny person. You know, people don't care. Like if, if, if I put stuff out on TikTok, for example, that I think is funny versus a person who doesn't even do stand up comedy, but is just a naturally funny person who's just putting stuff out every five minutes. People yes. don't like the label gets removed. People just go, Oh yeah, this person is funnier than you. Even though that stand up mm -hmm. comedy is the thing that you do. This person is funnier than stand up comedians. Yes. They will never yeah. be able to jump on stage and do that, but that's not the point. Those are semantics. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I think with, with advertising and with agencies, they almost have to start, and it's exactly what I'm trying to do right now, start writing scripts um, that naturally fit into the social media landscape because there is a texture, uh, you know, on the social media landscape. People get used to a rhythm and a style and a tone of videos, you know. I mean, gosh, there's you don't have 10 seconds to intro something. Yeah. It's gone. People, they, they will mm. move on. You know, yes. they, they have content at the tip of their fingers. They will slide, they will scroll up. You have to hit them in that first second. What's that first visual that pops up? So everything you thought you knew about writing an ad or writing, a, you know, coming up with a video, for example, you really have to switch it and go, you're really competing here with attention span, you know? So yeah. you'll notice, I mean, you've seen a lot of videos where people start with the punchline. They give you a taste of the punchline up front to lure you so you can actually watch this entire video and see how, how they got there. So storytelling becomes very, very, very important here. You know, you can't just rest on your laurels. You can't just do what everybody else has done before. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. I think Chicken mm. Licken has found that that beat very, very well. People now wait for chicken licken ads. You know, I guess Nando's has always done this. Yes. Nando's yes. naturally, I guess, fits into, you know, the, 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 the style and the tone of social media at the moment. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, dude, it's, it's, it's really, really, it's, it, I've had to unlearn a lot myself. I really have had to unlearn. There's, there's, yeah, there, there's something that, um, there's something that has come up in a different conversation that we've had, which, um, I think you've, you've just brought in here as well. And I'd like to get your opinion on it, which is the fact that one of the things that I think, I mean, in the, in the early days of social media, one of the things that was really cool and slick about what became viral content was that there was this feel of um, that this content does not have, it doesn't feel like an ad. It's not, it's not thoroughly produced, not super produced. It doesn't, you know, there was that edginess about content that was going viral at the yeah. time. And right now there's, there, there's a, a sense of certain types of high quality content is very, very obviously feels brand like. And there's a certain level of um, a content creator who sometimes doesn't feel as though they are mass produced, that they come from a high quality studio with high quality cameras. How do brands who want to, on the one hand, maintain the quality, um, but also want to be edgy, balance this or bring these two together, you know, because, because I guess you've worn both hats. Yeah. Sure. Tricky one. I don't even know what the answer to that is. And I don't think there is a right or wrong answer. You know, um, I think that question has come up quite a bit. And I think brands often, you know, sit in war rooms where they go, gosh, <laughs> how do we change our communication strategy, you know, to really start um, speaking to people? I think what's come up in, in recent years, and you mentioned the word earlier on, is authenticity. 
you know, I think we've seen a very big spike in less posed, less filtered, or unfiltered rather, natural moments captured, um, you know, no great lighting, no like overly photoshopped images. People don't want that anymore. I think we've gone past that era. I think authenticity, real stories, I think relatability is the word. I think if brands started becoming much more relatable and started telling stories that really resonate with, with people, um, that's going to win. But you see yeah. brands also often, and I guess us too as individual creatives, try and speak to everybody. And South Africa is not an easy place because you're speaking to a lot of different people here. One, you've got different languages. Two, you've got various LSMs and groups that you have to try and communicate to. So your language becomes, yeah. and, 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 and the way you tell stories becomes a very, very big factor. I think now it's about going back to what are you trying to say? Who are you trying to say it to? Being so stern, mm -hmm. you know, and not going, I'm gonna, I, I want 60 million people in South Africa to um, see my product and to resonate with my product. <laughs> it's not going to happen, you know. I think brands just have to become mm, a lot yeah, more honest yeah. with themselves and go, um, this is it, man. This is the group that I'm trying to speak to. It starts making content a little bit easier to write. And I think relatability, um, you know, starts playing a big role. Like we, you know, I don't know if you've seen, but like recently, you know, we've started seeing, a, especially in ads, very simple stories told in ads. I mean, there's, what ad is it where a blind grandfather goes to the beach for the first time, feels the sea, like sea sand and, 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 and sea water for the first time. He's never seen yes, it before. Yeah, yeah, that is a yeah. very common story. He didn't even need to be blind. You know, how many people yeah. in Cape Town, you know, in Johannesburg, for example, people, Kokasi, wherever it is, have never been to the beach before. You know, and that's, that's the honest yeah. truth. They've never been to the beach before. And you see, you just, you, you hit, you pull on a very specific heartstring there where you go, wow, that's a, that's a very, very interesting insight, you know, that mm -hmm. you just chose yeah. to, yeah. to, yeah. to wrap up. Yeah. So, so it's basically that, 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 that sense of relatability, I think you've yeah. mentioned and also being, I guess, I guess finding the most, finding the right human insight to appeal to a particular audience absolutely bro like to this day how is it possible that black people are still dancing in ads how in 2022 you know and getting excited yeah, of yeah. things it's it's so weird to me that that still happens i mean <laughs> where, where in your life have you ever seen this happen you know what i'm saying and, and yes, that's why yeah, yeah, I yeah. liked that insight of the of the beach thing, you know, because I'm like, wow, that's such a real thing that we don't speak about enough. Um, I did a talk once at an agency where they they asked me about empathy at agencies, you know, Whew, difficult topic, you know, to touch on. And I said, wow, this is actually it's actually an interesting topic to talk about because I often felt in agency that a lot of my seniors senior creative directors um, lacked a lot of empathy and didn't listen to my ideas where I come from. I'm from Umtata, ne? And a lot of the things that I grew up with that I know there's a group that is going to resonate with what I'm trying to say to you here, they were just like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> let's just have black, black people dancing again. How about we do that? Then I'm like, because mm -hmm. that, that was the yes. reference point, you know, and I go, we need more empathy. And maybe this goes back to your original question, you know, about what can agencies do differently? I think sit and listen to people, listen to their stories, listen to where they come from, you know, that's where you're going to get the gold. That's where you're going to get the real, real, real stuff coming through. You can't just brush it off because you don't understand, you know. You you really yeah. have to sit and, and, and listen. I mean, there's multiple, you know, cultures in, 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 well, hopefully nowadays in agencies. You really, if you're trying to, 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 to speak to South Africa, you got to listen to people. You yeah. got to listen to where they come from and try and understand, you know, from their point of view and not just, oh, yeah, 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 that sounds cool. Oh, will people like it? No, no, dig deep, like really sit and kind of give them the, 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 
the what would you call that the baton you know have them run with it yeah. um, for a little bit and you kind of step back and you can guide it as much as you can but let them run with it don't try and jump in um, because it's not your culture it's not your language it's not what you understand you know my two cents so there's something that, yeah I, I i get that and and, and there's something in that there's there's something else in that which which i've um i've asked I think heads of agencies and I continue asking, which is this thing of a lot of the time, the, the person who comes up with the, so the, that final insight or that final decision to say, let's go this way or let's go that way is someone who, who's, who happens to be a lot more seasoned in the industry with, um, a lot more work, um, behind them and a lot more understanding of the work behind them. So, so there is that. So the, the question is really, how do you then get someone who is as seasoned as that with um, a person who is younger in the room, but more relevant in current, um, in, in, in current culture and in what's happening on the streets and, and sort of get them together because, because the, 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 the more, I think the more seasoned you are in a space, the, the, the older you become, the less in most instances relevant you become with what's yeah. happening on the ground. <laughs> but, but the more relevant you are with what's happening on the ground, the less experienced and seasoned you are about what's happening in an in industry or a space. How do we then merge these yeah. two? And how are you finding, how are you finding this in the spaces that you en en engage and interact in? There's a great, um, it's one of my favorite things that that could have happened in the last year or two. Um, there's a senior executive creative director I know who at a very big above the line agency decided to break all rules because traditionally the way agencies have operated, it's always been art director, copywriter sit together, art director, copywriter, get the brief they come up with the big idea. Then you realize, okay, no, it's a 360 campaign. It's not just about coming up with an ad. This needs to be designed as well. So we need a designer. So then, then that big idea gets sent to the designer to go, okay, Sharp, this is the big idea. You must come up with something that's going to match this. And he's like, okay, cool. Then they go, oh, we need social media for this as well. Oh, okay, cool. Take what the designer's done. Take what the, the art director, copywriter has done. Okay, send it to the social media or digital team. Let them figure out how it's going to come together. Then all of that stuff has to then go to a creative director, uh, maybe even to a group head, maybe then to an executive creative director before it goes to the client, you know? So it gets passed on to a lot of different hands, but they never together. And this executive creative director went, herein lies the problem. We're not speaking to each other here at all. When that brief comes in, everybody sits together and solves it. None of this. None of this. The designer, the digital team, the art director, the copywriter, we all sit together and we solve this at the same time, because whatever idea yeah. the art director and the copywriter come up with, the designer or the digital people are right there to go, sorry, man, I like it. You're just going to have to rethink it a bit because it's not going to work if we do it A, B, and C, whatever it is. You know what I mean? And he says, yes, yes. the level of respect changes because now there are no titles, we are all in the same room together coming up with the same thing. When you start applying all the different titles, you know, it, it becomes very tricky because if this person who's supposedly in a more senior position scraps this idea because they don't like it and doesn't resonate with them, what's the point? You know, we're constantly now going to be just coming up with ideas or creating things because one person here who's the final decision maker it's it's always going to be his thoughts and his ideas that we end up yes, making. Yeah, but yeah. when you break that structure and you go, we all sit in a room together and we solve this problem as a team, your campaign then becomes a lot more holistic. What you put out on TV speaks directly to what you're putting out on billboards, speaks directly to what you're putting out on social media, speaks directly to what's going out to PR. It just makes everything feel well-rounded. And it's a great opportunity then to go back to what we were saying for somebody in that group to stop and go, hey, um, that's a terrible stereotype. It's funny to you, but I don't think 
it's it's a good thing to put out now. Or let me just give you a deeper insight on how we can make this work even better so it feels relatable and feels real. It just all comes down to communication. It's ironic, isn't it, that in the world of communication, yes, there's often yeah. not a lot of communication that happens within that. Happening, you see yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think it's, it's it's still very siloed yeah, in many, exactly, in many spaces because it happens in silos. You know, you come up with the idea. It's like a classic production line. Come up with the idea, clink, clink, move it on to the next person, and then it goes out. Then you pull the next brief in. It just keeps. It's just a constant, constant loop. And honestly. I think that's the way to do it. You could take it one step further. I mean, it might be very difficult from a logistical point of view is to start pulling client in early, you know, and say, hey, this is the direction that we want to go. So there are no surprises later on, you know, I don't know, but that was a good step to me. I thought that was really cool. And he completely broke that structure and they're still sticking to it now, you know, and everybody likes it. Because, like I say, there's none of that weird hierarchy nonsense now where you must listen to this person. Yeah, yeah it's more inclusive. An art director versus a designer. You know, I'm like, no. Um, on another on another note, I think um, just going into um, the platforms, I guess that you that that you work on or, or like to kind of work with. I mean, I've seen your work on Instagram, Twitter. I've seen your work on on uh, on YouTube. Would you say you've got your go-to platform that this is the one that you like to create for or create in? And if so, why that platform particularly? I think Instagram. Instagram is where you're going to find most of my work. Um, Twitter is a tricky one for me. I think Twitter, I kind of just share what I've created on Instagram. I don't create for Twitter. I find it to be a very, very negative place. You know, it's very dark and I don't think uh, the Twitter audience resonates with what I'm trying to do. It's not what they want to see, you know. Um, Instagram, I think people, it's, I guess it's what I've managed to build on there, you know. Um, anything I put out, people are expecting, you know, something funny, something creative. Um, it also has multiple ways for me to communicate. So apart from just static posts, their reels, there are stories. There's the highlights feature um, as well. You know, so there's multiple ways that I can um, that I can play with Instagram, um, YouTube. I've put some stuff up, but I'm not. I think I don't know. You know, I've I'm not as organic on YouTube as I should be. I think a lot of my content mm -hmm. on YouTube mm -hmm. still feels quite rigid. I haven't quite. Um, you know, I haven't sat down and thought about like my strategy and what I, what am I trying to say on YouTube? Right. You know, I can't just replicate a lot of the stuff I'm putting out on Instagram and just throw it on YouTube and expect the same results. You know, that's a whole mm. different beast altogether. You know, I mean, there was a small part of me that went, what if I only used YouTube to show process, BTS style content, you know, versus the final thing? Um, I know, I mean, you know, a lot of people kind of, will create short snippets on Instagram and you can find a longer version or whatever it is, you know, you shoot it straight to YouTube. Um, yeah, I haven't gotten there yet. And maybe, maybe just maybe a small part of me still thinks that, you know, in SA YouTube, very difficult place, um, you know, only because of, uh, you know, data and all of those things. I mean, I know that people, there are a lot of big, uh, I'm not a lot of big, there are a lot of viewers um, you know, in, in South Africa, well, people who view YouTube, a lot of big subscribers. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, it's, we are once again, imposter syndrome when it comes to mm. <laughs> deciding on platforms. I think I just feel a lot more comfortable and a lot more organic on Instagram at the moment. Um, I definitely mm. will make that transition to, um, to YouTube. Look, dude, to be honest with you, I'm still finding myself. Eh? The stuff that I'm doing is, is, is me still, still figuring it out. I, I'm not even, I mean, you know, people look at it and go, ah, oh, there's, there's, there's no way, you know, cause I've said this before in an interview that I'm still like, I don't know. I don't know what it is. You know, I don't know what that one thing is that I do. I do many things, you know, and I'm constantly just trying to search Absolutely. for those things and it stresses me out a lot. Yeah. It really does. Um, and once I'm comfortable I guess, with this platform. And once I feel like I've, this is it, you know, this is my voice. This is, 
this is what I do. These are the kinds of stories I like to tell. I may step it up then and move on to a YouTube and start doing things in longer form, higher production, whatever it is, you know? Yeah. I think, I mean, I, I think, uh, for me, it doesn't, it absolutely doesn't show that you are necessarily learning. I think I, I, and I'm sure very many other people find your content really compelling. And of course, it's evident that you are learning I th on your end because it keeps improving. Yeah. So you keep finding ways to improve. So, so, so that, that, that comes, that comes through a lot because the content keeps improving. The quality of the content keeps improving. The types of things that you put out there keep, um, keep improving. And you mentioned Instagram and there's a lot of talk around Instagram in terms of its algorithm and what it does, Instagram going in the way of um, similar direction as TikTok or the two of them kind of merge, almost looking as though they are doing more and more of uh, the similar sorts of things. What are your thoughts on TikTok? Um, I love TikTok, but I have to untrain and unlearn to be able to to be successful on TikTok. TikTok doesn't care how your content looks. Is it funny? Is it educational? Is it motivating? That's all we want to see. That's all we care about. I think with TikTok, I'm still a little bit too like, I'm still trying to be too much of a perfectionist, still trying to get the lighting right. I'm still trying to edit in a proper way. That's not what people want to see there. And that's also, I mean, to be honest with you, if I go onto TikTok and I see something that's a little bit too polished, kind of tune out, you know, and move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, right. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've chatted to, to, to one of the, 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 the strategists at TikTok who, who really wants to have a meeting with me and wants me on board because they think I could do well on that platform as well. Um, and I mean, I still need to set that meeting up, but you know, I, if I don't jump on it, I think I will be shooting myself in the foot because I think it's a really good outlet for me just to release a lot of the ideas that I procrastinate on and that I harp on because that one is fast moving. You know, like I say, that audience doesn't care about everything I care about, especially on Instagram. Instagram is designed, yeah. you know, to, to look good and to be polished and, you know, things must look a specific way. It's just, it's well, like I said, I mentioned the word, it's the texture of that platform. You know, TikTok has that its own texture, you know, they want it to feel real as real as possible. I mean, the biggest creators on TikTok, pull out a camera now and start shooting, post it and they move on and they'll shoot something else in the next 10 minutes and they just keep moving on. They don't care. They don't harp on it for too long, you know? So um, I think i got to unlearn as much as possible to, to really do well in that space <clears throat> and just have fun with it. I think that's the thing, man. You know, within all of this, sometimes I take it a little bit too seriously. Um, I definitely need to start having more fun with it. And I'm starting to realize that, you know, it gets very stressful because my wife, if I'm in uh, whatever piece of content alone, my wife is the one who shoots it for me, you know, but I'm starring in this thing. I'm trying to remember lines, but I'm also looking at the way she's holding the camera. Sometimes go, hey, can you just do this? Can you shift that? Can I just have a look at it afterwards? So I'm jumping in between this, uh, wearing all these multiple hats, even while shooting and it becomes quite tricky um, you know, and, and then I stop having fun with it, um, until I get to the edit suite now. And then once I start seeing everything together, that's when, um, I guess I click, I kind of click back in and start, you know, making it fun for me again. You mentioned, um, you mentioned the, you know, or a meeting or a conversation you had with a TikTok strategist and you getting onto TikTok. Do, do, do these partnerships matter? Do partnerships with social networks matter to you? As in, if, if Instagram is, if Instagram themselves are paying attention because you're creating content on Instagram, if Meta are paying attention, if, if YouTube or Google is paying attention, if you're creating for Google and TikTok themselves are paying attention, if you're creating for TikTok, do those partnerships matter to you in terms of your, your, your outlook on creating for a particular platform or any on or, or on on uh, or on a platform, they do. 
I think those relationships are very important. Um, it's always nice to hear, you know, because sometimes we come up with our own theories from what we've seen and what the internet tells us, like you mentioned about the algorithm earlier on. And then you have somebody who works on, who works for that, that platform to go, no, 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 that's, that's not actually it. This is, this is actually what we um, prioritize or whatever it is, you know, um, it then sets you back and it kind of makes you look at what you're doing and, and oftentimes, I mean, it's happened this way. I mean, I, I know somebody who works for Facebook. He's a creative director for Facebook, you know. And I asked him this question once. I was like, listen, man, um, have a look at some of my content. I'm going to give you like a week or so. Just go through and, and, and just see if it, if it fits on this platform and if the rhythm of what I'm trying to put out is right. And he was like, yeah, I think you're overthinking it way too much, you know. And I think people overthink the algorithm way too much. We try and play to the algorithm versus just making really good outstanding content you know because you pander to what you think once again it goes back to our initial conversation you start to pander and move towards what you think the platform and people on the platform want to see versus just creating great content great content is great content you know if 10 percent of the audience like the algorithm supposedly only um, appeals to interact with that thing and love it because it's really good, it's naturally going to spread, you know? That's, I, and you know, another part of me goes, sometimes I think the algorithm is put in place to, to showcase the good stuff, you know? And to showcase the interesting stuff as well, you know, versus what we think of it. Yeah. Because, man, like I say, good content is good content or great content is great content. Exactly. And it's going, it's always going to get exactly. a priority. It's always going to get shine. So I think, your, yeah, yeah. It's going to, it's going to rise, it's going always, to rise up. Exactly. To the you top. know, so, yeah. so your yeah. challenge is just to, to, to try and make great content and not what everybody else is doing out there. And I think that's the trick. That's the, the, the danger with reels and reels becoming like TikTok. Um, is you have creators just jumping on trends and just copying what everybody else is doing in their own style. And I'm like, there's nothing wrong with that, but what happens to the original thinking? You know, what happens to the, to the great ideas? And that's, and I think that's where the algorithm uh, question starts to kick in where people go, yeah, but you know, I'm putting out all of this stuff that is supposed to be trending at the moment, but I'm not getting any hits on it. And I'm just like, yeah, but we've seen it before, you know? Where's that original stuff mm. you were doing mm. before these trends started kicking in, before these trending, 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 right. this, trending that? Right. You see, that's when you are pandering to just the platform now and you stop, you step, you, you kind of step away from doing it um, or creating because, you know, it's, it's yeah. what it's because you're trying to create value, you're trying to entertain or whatever it is. But now you're just pushing to be part of the, of the system, essentially, you know? Mm, you lose that very essence that we were talking yeah, about earlier. man. What got you in this platform in, or on these platforms in the first place? Yeah. In terms of um, you working with brands as a content creator, what's your preference? Do you prefer working with the brand directly or do you prefer working through an agency? <sighs> oh, that's a tricky one. Um, because <laughs> I've had good and bad experiences on both ends. Um, right. Gosh, yeah, I can't answer that, you know, because it's it's like really balanced out. Sometimes I've worked with agencies who just don't get it, you know, who just, um, so the brand is looking for, cause, and then I'm on the brand side, you know, so the brand is looking for something. I go, cool, I know exactly what they want. And then the agency kind of takes it and, you know, just overthinks it a little bit and, you know, get in, gets into agency mode and then writes a brief that takes away from what the brand is actually looking for. And then I look at it and I'm like, yeah, I, I, I don't know, man. I just don't see this at all. You know, I don't see what you guys are trying to get out of this. And because a lot of times, you know, agency is so tricky, man. You know, there, there's a, what's the word I'm looking for? A, um, yes. Why can't I find this word right now? You know, when, when people are, are just so, Tradi traditional, yes, I think that's the word, in their methods and the way they do things, especially mm -hmm. big above the line agencies, right, very traditional. Right. So a lot of agencies don't, they don't really think about the social media content side of things. You know, it's still, 
big TV mm-hmm. ad, big radio ad, uh, print campaign. You know, it's all of those things because there's awards, you know, that, that, that a lot of creatives are trying to win, you know, in those spaces. So that's where it gets tricky. You can't have that conversation with a lot of uh, creatives in agency because it's not digital and, 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 and social media is not something they, they think about first. Um, mm-hmm. And vice versa. You know, there are times I've worked with brands and I'm just like, why am I speaking to you directly? Like you have no idea what this is about. You know, is there no agency that can come on board that can – or a strategist or whatever. Do you know how many times I've been given a brief where I've basically had to write the strategy and rewrite the brief to be able to solve what they wanted out of this? It's happened so many times, you know, because mm. some people don't know what they want. They just they just go, okay, you see this guy, yeah, take this guy, give him this, this whatever it is, and uh, let him put something out. But I'm like, it doesn't work that way. You know, we, we need to break it down. We need to define it in like three lines, what the outcome is here, what you are looking for exactly. It's going to make my job easier. It's going to make you feel happy at the end of the day. So I can't say, man, if it's agency or client because I've, or brand, I've yeah, had, yeah. I've had bad experiences on both because now what often on happens both sides, is yeah. the other, there's a third element to this is I often don't work with agencies i work with pr companies so you have a pr person briefing you on a creative campaign for a b and c but they don't look at it from that that perspective they look at it from a pr angle you know so it just becomes, exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah so 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 they want yeah. uh they want very specific things yes. um like uh uh, yeah, so yeah, like AVEs right right and all yeah. of these things. Absolutely. And then I'm like, it's not going to work, man. Like, how about I come up with the idea and first, and then you can sit down and break it down. But then, mm, they don't see it that way. It's like, we've written out how we want to promote this. Reverse engineer yeah. your creative so that it slots into what we've done. You know, it's it's tough, man. It's very yeah. tough. Mm-hmm. In closing, in closing, um, Donovan, what would you say... Um, in your in your view, brands and agencies should consider before approaching you to collaborate with them. What is what, what's the background work that needs to happen before they say they want to work with you, or before they approach you to work with them? me specifically, or creators? No, you, you. Um, and and I think I think let's 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 do it both ways. You specifically, and also content creators in general. My answer, I think, is going to, I think I'm going to answer both of those things. I think that it's very important for everybody involved to go through the profiles, pick out five pieces of content, five pieces that really stand out that you think are great, right? Look at them and see if there's a common thread in there. And see if that personality relates to your brand's personality. Because then you're going to get perfect, seamless synergy, right? Um, I think that's the main thing is often, I mean, and this has happened to me before, where somebody has seen one piece of content. We loved that video that you did. Can you do that for us here? I'm like, <laughs> it's one video, you know? It's, you can't can't do that. I think that that kind of research is important. The other thing I think is very important is, I think with brands collaborating with creators, I think that era of collaborating with people just because they've got really big followings is slowly dying out right now. Audiences see right through it. You know, they can see the the paid partnership a mile away and they're like, nah, we're not really going to interact with this kind of thing. I think it's very important for brands or agencies to be honest with themselves and start picking creatives, creators. No, let me say creatives. I like to call them creatives, not creators. Creatives who make 100% complete sense. 100% complete sense 
to the communication they're trying to put out. I think it's very, very important to 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 break people down and go, okay, this one, there's definitely a common thread here. They like to do this, 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 and that. Look at their audience. Who are the people that like to interact with them? What is the level of interaction? Is there mostly laughing emojis? Is it mostly, you know, people being grateful, you know, for, for this uh, information, whatever, if it's motivational, for example, you know, you can find little cues just in the comment section, you know, and you, you pick out five posts and you look at the cues, you can really see what people are saying. And, 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 and from there, you can kind of draft a brief and draft a campaign to go, okay, sure. This person's audience really resonates with this style of thing. They love it when this person does this, for example. And, you know, like with Instagram, you know, there's so many clues there. Don't just look at the pieces of content on the feed. I think look at the highlights. The highlights will give you lots of cues as well. Look at the stories. What are they doing where it's not very curated, where they're just out and about, just and jay, you know, is the personality similar? Is that whatever that you're trying to buy into, does it carry through into those kinds of things? Because then you really get a sense of who that person is. Because often brands don't deal with the people. They deal with managers. Dealing with a manager, very different story. Because a manager will tell you straight up, one, how much things cost. And those costs can be astronomical and will make you go, wow, that person is expensive. Uh, you know, and, and often managers can, uh, man, and I've seen it happen a lot of times, you know, where people would just, they, they're shocked and flabbergasted, you know, when, when they, when they get, you know, certain feedback from a manager because they, they always think that it's the person they're trying to work with who is that way. You know what I mean? So I think it's really good yeah, to do your yeah. research and, and you know, figure out all the the cue points. How do these people interact with some of the people in the comment section? You'll really get a very good sense of who you're trying to deal with here. Um, you know, and yeah. like for me, for example, I'm always trying to push the joke, man. I'm always trying to. So if you go through my comment section, you're going to see a lot of laughing emojis, you know. Um, I like to do self-deprecating humor. I don't take myself too seriously. You know, that's why you won't just see like complete, like posed pictures of myself and it's all perfect. No, I don't do that at all. That's not my vibe, you know. Um, so the second you don't notice any of those things, don't bother expecting that from me because I'm not going to give that to you at all. <laughs> it's never going to come, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I just think more like deeper research, deeper research than just numbers. Because I think that's where it stops, you know? How many followers do they have? How much interaction do they get on e on each one of their posts? Okay, Sharp, that's the person. Let's go. Awesome. Thank you very much, Donovan. I think uh, I think that closes it off nicely. Uh, do your research. Get into it, of course, with the mentality of collaborating rather than just pushing a brief. And um, whenever you whenever you go to a content creator, whenever you collaborate with a content creator, go into it understanding that their essence must come through in what you are bringing rather than rather than brand first. I think, I mean, those are some of the things that I got out of that. And thank you very much once again for making the time. It was really insightful. I always love these conversations, man. I can't wait to hear it. Thank you for listening to The Lead Creator. Did you get one insight that's worth sharing from this episode? Please share it with your network or your friends. Pop me some of your ideas and innovative finds on Twitter, on at Mongesi. This podcast is available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also find me on mongesi.com. <laughs>